I'm Keith R.A. DeCandido, and welcome to the latest episode of Grant COVID Readings. I'm reading my writing to make the pandemic palatable. Uh, I'm doing another Dragon Precinct story. I've had Dragon Precinct on the mind lately. Um, I just finished writing a new Dragon Precinct story called The Gorbangan Rampages, uh, which you can support on Indiegogo. If you go to my website at decandido.net, there's a link to it there. Um, or just search on Indiegogo for Gorbangan, G-O-R-B-A-N-G-I-N. Um, it's going to be the only thing you find under that name, believe me. Um, I just finished the, the novelette, really. It's a 12,000-word story. Uh, it's going to be made available to the Indiegogo supporters, but because of the way Indiegogo works, you can still support it and get your hands on a copy of the story as well as some of the other perks. Anyway, um, because of that and because I'm gearing up to write Phoenix Precinct, I've had Dragon Precinct on the brain, and uh, so I wanted to read another one of my many short stories in that milieu. This particular story is called Fire in the Hole, and I originally wrote it in 2010 for an anthology called Dragon's Lord. Um, in the period between 2004, when Dragon Precinct was first published by Simon & Schuster, uh, and 2011, when Unicorn Precinct was published by Dark Quest Books, uh, it was kind of foul. The, the, the imprint that Dragon Precinct was published as part of with Simon & Schuster was discontinued. So the series was kind of left orphaned. Uh, and then later, in 2011, it was picked up by Dark Quest, and it's kind of rescued by the small press, as many series have been over the last uh, 15 years or so. And, um, well, 20 years now. Well, whatever. Anyway, I can't, I can't do math. The, the way I kept the universe alive between 2004 and 2011 was through short stories. I've still done short stories since then, also. But in particular, before Dark Quest picked the series up, that was a good way for me to do it. Um... Dark Quest also published Fire in the Hole, um, and uh, it was edited by Danielle Ackley McPhail and uh, Jennifer Ross and Jeffrey Wyman, and it was all about stories about things that lured dragons, basically, as, as the title would indicate. Uh, Dark Quest has since kind of fallen into the swamp, um, so it's not really that easy to find Dragon's Lore anymore. You can probably find used copies online and stuff, but conveniently, uh, I reprinted Fire in the Hole in Tales from Dragon Precinct, my 2013 uh, short story collection. And uh, since I can't find my copy of Dragon's Lore anyway, I'm going to read it from there. Anyway, this is Fire in the Hole. Um, the, the, I, I should also add that one of the reasons why I wanted to write this story in particular, and my t-shirt should give you a hint as to that, uh, people see Dragon Precinct and they think, oh look, a book with dragons in it, except of course it doesn't. Um, the, the different precincts indicate uh, the different regions of Cliff's End, Dragon Precinct being the middle class district, Unicorn Precinct being the upper class district, and so on. Um, so I figured I should have at least one Dragon Precinct story in which a dragon actually appears, and this is it. So, without further ado, fire in the hole. I hate Midsummer. At Lieutenant Danthris Tresillian's 15th uttering of that exclamation in the past hour, her partner, Lieutenant Torin Van Wivold, sighed heavily, an action he hid from Danthris by stroking his thick red beard. They were pacing along the wooden barricades that had been placed on either side of Mirka Way to keep the crowd from interfering with the Midsummer Parade. Unlike the last several years, the Cliffs End Castle Guard decided not to pay the exorbitant fee, which had gone up by 20% every year, to the Brotherhood of Wizards for a magical barricade that was more effective against a teeming throng of people pushing against it than a series of long, thick blocks of wood each supported by four shorter, thinner blocks of wood, the Lumber Guild charged half of what the Brotherhood did for their barricade, and the Lord and Lady's Chamberlain had insisted that it would do the job just as well. Watching four muscle-bound humans, three short but sturdily built dwarves, and a tall elf all pushing against one of the barricades trying to get a better view of the flower-covered float put together by the Gardener's Guild, Torin was skeptical as to the Lumber Guild's claim. Danthris had also noticed the eight people jockeying for position, with the elf in serious danger of stepping on two of the dwarves. The third dwarf glared up at the elf, and Torin knew that that could only spell trouble. Hey! Danthris put a hand to the hilt of the standard-issue sword that dangled from her hip scabbard as she bellowed. This garnered no response, as the dwarf was too busy cursing at the elf in Rateldish. Torin's facility for the elf's native tongue was weak, but the dwarf's body language spoke volumes. Danthris bellowed again, now standing directly on the other side of the barricade from the group. Hey, that's enough. Looking down on Danthris with the disdain that only an elf could muster, he said in common, 
for you to speak to me that way, half-breed. Knowing that Danforth's likely answer to this query would be along the lines of the person who will kill you in six seconds, Torin stepped in. She is a lieutenant in the Cliffs End Castle Guard, as am I, and we have the authority from the Lord and Lady themselves to arrest anyone we feel has the potential to disrupt this most solemn occasion. Danforth added, either the elf moves, the dwarves move, or all four of you go to the hole. One of the dwarves said, We're not moving! It took us hours to get up to the edge of the barricade. If we change our location now, we'll never see anything! The elf was still staring down his nose at Danvers. I thought the lieutenants and the castle guard were tasked with solving crimes, not crowd control. Or did they realize that a person of your limited breeding was incapable of such complex tasks? To Torin's surprise, Danvers' response was not to take her sword all the way out of its scabbard, but to instead smile. Her face, which combined the worst elements of her dual heritage, did not allow for pleasant smiles, and this one was nasty even by her high standards. At the sight of it, the elf visibly paled. Thank you. I was really hoping I'd get to kill someone today. Putting a hand on her shoulder, Torrin said, Don't, Danthris. There'll be paperwork. The elf held up a hand. I refuse to be treated this way! She threatened me! Torrin stepped between Danthris and the elf and grabbed the latter's arm. Sir, I'm afraid that in the name of the Lord and Lady, I must place you under arrest. Step under the barricade and make no sudden movements, please. By this time, they had created a spectacle, and more people were watching the tableau than were observing the parade. To be fair, the Cooper's Guild float was going by, and all they'd done was put a pile of barrels on a cart. Torin wasn't concerned. The crowd would find something else to distract them soon enough, especially once the float from the Prostitutes Guild came into view. Torin led the elf up Mirka Way toward Oak Way, the official border between Unicorn and Dragon Precincts, and the separation point between the upper class and their mansions, and the middle class and their more modest homes. Oak Way itself had been a simple tree-lined pathway for many years, the land owned by the Haslar family. The Haslars had owned one of the two banks in Cliff's End, but a year ago, Jatan Haslar had a falling out with the Lord and Lady. He agreed to a merger with the Cliffs End Bank prior to the entire family moving to Yaren. While the Haslar mansion at the end of Oakway was purchased by the Grovis family, owners of the Cliffs End Bank, the rest of the thoroughfare was sold to the Lord and Lady, who put it up for public auction. So where Oakway had once been empty of habitation, it was now lined with buildings at various station stages of completion. Where are you taking me? The elf asked angrily as they started down Oakway. I know for a fact there are no precincts here. Your grasp of the obvious is impressive, good sir elf, Torrin said with a smile. We have commandeered one of the new homes here as a holding area. You see, Danthus added, the sheer volume of offenders such as yourself that were forced to arrest during midsummer requires it. The elf said nothing in reply, but did scowl at Danthus again. She just smiled back. One of the benefits of the money saved on not using the Brotherhood's barricade was that the guard was able to pay for the additional holding areas, which proved a boon. The holding areas in the castle guard's various headquarters, both the dungeons in the Lord and Lady's castle and the areas in the four precincts, all collectively known as the Hold, were always filled beyond capacity within the first hour of midsummer, and the added space ameliorated the problem quite nicely. Two guards... Manfred from Unicorn Precinct and Kellen from Dragon Precinct were standing at the doorway to the house that was being used. Though completed, it was not yet furnished or occupied, and the owner was more than willing to delay moving in for a fortnight in exchange for the castle guard's cash. Kellen looked at Manfred and smiled. That's a dozen elves. You owe me a copper. At Torrin's look, Manfred shook his head. I figured we get to a dozen dwarves before we got to a dozen elves holed up in here. This ship brain means I lose. The elf sneered. Wagering on prisoners? Hiring half-breeds? No wonder Cliff's End is such a cesspool if this is the brand of person they tasked with maintaining the Lord and Lady's law. Danthris regarded the two guards. Don't feel any great urge to treat this one gently. Manfred reached out to roughly grab the elf by the shoulder. No problem at all. He just cost me a copper. As Manfred led the elf inside, Kellen said, How come they have you guys on crowd control? Torin winced. The last thing he wanted was for Danthris to get started, but answering that question would do it. It wasn't my idea. Believe me. Danthris practically spit, spat the words. 
but the members of the Lord and Lady's Court always complain about the unruly crowds during midsummer, and can't they just put more guards on Mirka Way to keep the mobs in line? So then the Lord and Lady complain to Osric, and he puts all the detectives on shit duty. Attempting to change the subject, Torin regarded Kellen. Betting on elves versus dwarves, eh? That's novel for midsummer. Shrugging, Kellen said, uh, everyone bets on the dragon. It's boring. Manfred and me, we wanted to vary the routine a little, you know? Torin chuckled. The entire Midsummer Festival was based around the yearly sighting of the dragon. A golden creature that lived somewhere deep in the forest of Nimvale. It flew over Cliff's End every year at the summer solstice, circled the city-state once, then flew back home. Some years, it also breathed fire. Legend had it that if the dragon breathed fire, it would be a hot summer. If it didn't, the summer would be cooler. There it is! Torin wasn't sure who had shouted, but everyone looked up at the words. The timing of the dragon's arrival was never consistent from year to year, beyond a general proximity to the solstice, which made its arrival the second most popular subject of wagers after whether or not it would breathe fire. Good, Danfer said emphatically. She had been concerned that the dragon wouldn't show up until tomorrow, meaning another day of the insanity. Smiling, Torin scanned the skies for, the, for a sign of the large golden form. Then he spied it. Flying so far overhead, and never with any riders, it was impossible to say how large the dragon truly was. However, Torin estimated that the creature was almost as long from the horns on its head to the pointed end of its tail as ten elves, or a dozen humans. It was covered in golden scales that reflected the sunlight, making it difficult to stare right at it. Its wings, also golden, flapped lazily, spanning the same length as the dragon's body. Just as it had every year since Torin first arrived in Cliff's End a decade ago, the dragon circled the city-state. This year, though, Torin noticed something. The center of the circle seemed to be right over where he and Danthris were standing on Oak Way. I wonder if it does that every year, Danthris said. What, circle around this particular spot? Torin asked. I observed that as well. Shh! One of the pedestrians, a gnome, hissed. Only then did Torin realize that the entire thoroughfare had gone quiet at the sight of the dragon, excepting Torin and Danthras' own conversation. Danthras stared angrily at the gnome. It's not as if the dragon can hear us, or will react badly to our talking. It's just going to circle four times, maybe breathe fire, and then bugger off for a year so we can get back to living our lives. You should show some respect to the dragon, the gnome said. Actually, you should show more respect to us. Denver started to move toward the gnome, and Torin feared he would once again have to keep his partner from inflicting unnecessarily vi unnecessary violence on a civilian. Before he could interpolate himself between Danthras and the gnome, though, they were both stopped short by several incoherent screams. Looking around, Torin saw that everyone was still looking up at the dragon, but many were pointing at it. Following their gazes upward, Torin felt his stomach turn inside out. The dragon had stopped circling and was now flying downward, right toward Oak Way. It only took a moment. With just two flaps of its wings, the dragon had swooped down to just a dozen or so feet above the ground. On those occasions when the dragon did breathe fire, it created a beautiful fireball that lit up the sky even on the sunniest of days. But that was from a safe distance in the air. Today the dragon waited until it was right over one of the new homes on Oak Way, and then breathed fire right into that house. This fireball was loud, and blinding, and so hot that even at this distance, Torin felt as if his long beard had been singed. Then, in the time it took the dragon to flap its wings three more times, it had taken to the air and was gone, leaving a burning house and a panicked populace behind. The gnome glowered at Danthras. I told you to show the dragon respect! Danthras was beyond exhausted when she and Torin dragged themselves back to the castle the following morning. Her intention had been to go home and sleep for several days straight, but as she and Torin were about to do so, one of the youth squad came by. The girl, one of a cadre of children employed by the castle guard as messengers, informed them that Captain Osric wanted to see them at guard headquarters in the eastern wing of the Lord and Lady's castle immediately. Summons from the captain were not to be ignored. Danthras came very close to doing so, anyhow. Dragging themselves to the captain's office, Danthras couldn't even be cheered by the smell of pastries that Sergeant Jonas's wife made every morning. It didn't help that there was no sign of Jonas himself, 
nor of the other four detectives on their shift. Danvers hoped it was because they were still helping with the post-Midsummer cleanup, because if they were allowed to rest while Danvers and Torrin had to haul themselves to the captain's office, there would be hell to pay. Osric was sitting behind his desk, facing two people in the guest chairs. Danthris was about to turn around and leave until he was done with this meeting, but Osric said, Tresillian! Van Wivelt! Glad you're here! Come in! The captain was sharpening his dagger, which was always a bad sign. Danthris hissed a breath out through her teeth. Not only was she denied sleep, but she had to stand during a meeting. Captain, she said, we've just spent the entire night putting out a fire, getting medical care for the wounded and burned people, and arresting panicking, rioting idiots. Is there any way that this meeting can wait until... Now, Lieutenant, said one of the people in the guest chairs, it cannot wait. In fact, it's waited too long as it is. The person turned around, and Danthris let out a sigh. The person in question was Lord Ithrin, the wizard in charge of affairs in the Cliffs End vicinity for the Brotherhood of Wizards. Danthras had yet to share a single meeting with Ithran that was pleasant in any way, shape, or form. Osric regarded Danthras and Torin with his right eye, the left one as ever covered with a black silk patch. There's a double murder that you two are required to investigate. Danthras found herself torn between anger at being asked to work a case when she was physically and mentally exhausted and relief at being put back on the duty she was actually paid to perform. Since she was already angry, she went with the former, as it was less work. Torin asked, Who are the victims? Ella and Garrick Fantar. Rolling her eyes, Danther said, Well, that's easy. They weren't murdered. They died in a fire. Domi Fantar was the owner of the house that was in the path of the dragon's fireball. Ella and Garrick were his wife and son. The other guest turned around and Danthras had to resist the urge to take out her sword when she recognized Sir Romit, the Lord and Lady's Chamberlain, and Danthras' least favorite member of the upper class. The captain told us that you were both on Oak Way when the dragon arrived yesterday, Romit said. Torin nodded. Yes, we were. Then you know better. The Fantiles were murdered by the dragon. Unable to help herself, Danthras burst out laughing. So did Torin. No one else in the room followed suit. In fact, Osric's scowl deepened considerably, and Ithran said, This is hardly a laughing matter, lieutenants. Oh, I disagree, Danthras said. What do, you expect us, what do you expect us to bring in the dragon for questioning? I don't think it'll fit in the interrogation room. The Brotherhood will deal with the dragon, Ithran said. Torrin smiled under his thick red beard. Really? I was under the impression that the Brotherhood generally left dragonkind alone. We generally do, Ithran said sharply. But generally, dragons don't murder citizens. We need to determine what the dragon's motivations are. Then do so, Danfer said. Anytime a crime involves magic, you people come in and take over. This does not involve magic, Ithran said. But it does concern us. Torin grinned. Because the reason why you leave dragonkind alone is because you cannot control them. Hardly. Ithran's denial was unconvincing. However, that is not the point. What is the point? Danthras asked. You wish to know the dragon's motivations. What's stopping you? The wizard hesitated. Danthras took a perverse pleasure in seeing that, as pages rarely did so. Finally, Ithran spoke. The circumstances require that an investigation be performed. The lieutenants of the castle guard are specifically trained in such, and we feel that it will facilitate matters if the pair of you perform that investigation. Danthras and Torin exchanged shocked looks. Let me see if I understand you, Danthras said slowly. You want our assistance. You, who routinely interfere in our work, who regularly ride roughshod over our investigations, now you want us to perform an investigation for you. No, Romit said with a stricken glance at him. That, that is not what is happening here. The Lord and Lady feel that this is a murder like any other, and should be investigated just like any other. It simply happens that the Lord and Lady's wishes coincide with those of the Brotherhood, and we are all in agreement that the pair of you are best suited to carry out the investigation. Really? Danther shot Osric a look, but the captain was focused very heavily on sharpening his dagger. The fact that the Brotherhood is utterly incapable of performing a murder investigation has nothing to do with it. Be careful, Lieutenant, Ithran said in a low voice. Why? Danther stared at the wizard. You're the ones who need our help. Osric finally spoke up while getting to his feet. Threats aren't necessary, your lordship. My lieutenants are simply tired after a very long day and night protecting this city-state. 
They will, of course, carry out the investigation as part of their regular duties. If that is all, Ramit and Ithrin exchanged glances of their own. Then they also rose. The Chamberlain said, I, I believe so, yes, Captain. Good day. While Ramit cleared out of Osric's office quickly, the wizard stayed behind. Is there anything else, your lordship? The captain asked. No, Ithrin said, but I will, of course, be accompanying the detectives. Denthris put her head in her hands. Very well, then, Torin said before Danthris would comment, which was probably very wise of him, given Danthris's current mood. Generally, the first step of a murder investigation is to examine the scene of the crime. There's not much to examine, Danthris said. The place was burned to a crisp. What she didn't say aloud was that she'd spent all night on Oakway and was displeased at the prospect of going back with Ithrin in tow. It's still worth looking, Torin said. Ithrin's face grew sour. I agree with Lieutenant Tresillian. We need to determine the dragon's reasons for targeting that house and learn why it did so this year as opposed to years past. Denthris shrugged and also reconsidered her feelings on the matter if Ithrin actually agreed with her. Apparently something changed this year. Well, one very obvious thing did change, Torin said. The homes on Oak Way. All those constructions are new since last summer. Yes, Ithrin said, but why that house? All the more reason to examine what's left of it, said Torin. Denthris nodded. Agreed, but I doubt we'll find much. When we're done there, we should bring Domi Fantar in, ask him about the construction of the house. Ithrin started to gesture carefully. Excellent! Let us go! The next thing Denthris knew, she was doubled over on Oak Way, disgorging the contents of her stomach. She really hated teleport spells. As expected, the burned-out remains of the Fantar residence provided little of use. To Denthris's relief, Ithrin stayed in the background most of the time they were there. The bulk of what they found, of course, were the burned-out husks of items that used to be in the Fantar house, or used to be the Fantar house. The bodies of the two victims had, of course, long since been removed. After that, the detectives had the surviving Fantar brought to the interrogation room in the eastern wing of the castle. To Denthris's dismay, Fantar had nothing of use to say. He'd never encountered a dragon before, never had dealings with them, didn't entirely believe they were real. With a guilty look at Ithrin, he admitted that he always thought the midsummer festivities to be a trick performed by the Brotherhood. Danthris was about to let tell Fantar he could leave when Torin spoke. Did you remove anything from the grounds before you had the house built? A tree or a rock or an object of any kind? Fantar squinted. Oh, there was a mess of oak trees, yeah. Had to clear them out. Lumber Guild paid good money for them, too. Only oaks? Torin asked. Yeah, that's it. And nothing else. Oh, well, there was that old trail marker. Uh, it was a rock dug deep in the ground. Cost five silver to have the thing removed, but the fellow from the museum paid me three gold for it, so I came out ahead. Danthris had been about to complain to Torrin about wasting time, but this last statement made her hold that back. Instead, she stared at Fantar. You're sure this was a trail marker? That's what the fellow from the museum said. Fantar shrugged. Said it was buried so deep it had to be from before the city was founded. And there was trail markers all over the place then. You know, leading folks to the Garamond Sea. Why? Just trying to get a complete picture of what happened, Mr. Fantar. We may have more questions. Danthris hustled the man to the door. Ithrin stared at Danthris and Torin, both after Fantar left the room. I fail to understand what a trail marker has to do with... Oakway didn't exist until long after Cliff's End was founded, Danthris said. The members of the Lord and Lady's Court had the oaks planted and the thoroughfare established in order to separate them from the riffraff. The only trails, and the only places that would have old trail markers are in Mirka Way, Sandy Brook Way, and Salmon Alley. I still fail to understand, Torrin said, if it wasn't a trail marker, it was obviously something else. Something that predates the city's founding, and therefore possibly something an ancient creature such as a dragon might know about. Ithrin rubbed his hands through his bone-white beard. Well, very well. We shall proceed to the museum. The mage started to gesture. Before Danthris could stop him, they were instantly at the Lord Kiowa Museum on Galvin Hill, and Danthris was dry-heaving, having nothing left to throw up after the last unexpected teleport spell. Don't do that, she said once her retching was under control. But Ithrin ignored her, instead demanding to see the museum manager, throwing his rank around with typical arrogance. Oh, yes, the manager, a mousy man named Tirga, said in a whispery voice. I recall. It turned out not to be a trail marker at all. It wasn't much of anything, really, just a rock with some markings on it. I've been meaning to get them translated, but take me to it. Now! Tirgut swallowed loudly and dashed off to the back room. 
When he came back with a rock the size of a person's head held in both arms, Ithrin cast a quick spell, which caused the rock to rotate. Danthris didn't recognize the lettering on it, which was un unsurprising. Ithrin didn't either, which was. These are sigils, they're not of a type I recognize. I do, Torin said quietly. Danthris shot him a look. You do? I think so. From some ancient texts in Miverin. Ithrin regarded Torin with something resembling respect. You're from Miverin? What brought you to such a place as this? Free will, your lordship, Torin said with more politeness than Danthris would have in his place, especially since Torin's name indicated his Miverin heritage. Then again, Danthris was willing to bet that Ithrin didn't recall either of their names. Torin continued. The life of a philosopher was not for me. However, I did study at the Collegium, and I saw many ancient texts that used these symbols. Unfortunately, I can't tell you what they mean. I doubt anyone in Cliff's End can. But then he turned back to Danthris and, Ith and Ith Ithrin and smiled. But there is one possible way to find out. How's that? Danthris said. Interview the only witness we haven't spoken to yet. Danthris frowned and then realized what he meant. You're not serious. We must go to the perpetrator and the only suspect we have. The dragon has encircled the city-state every midsummer since Cliff's, End fo Cliff's End's founding. The, this rock has also been there that long, and the first midsummer it wasn't there was when the dragon first changed its routine and killed two people. We have to go to its lair. Danthris turned to Ithrin. Fine, take us there. Ithrin blinked. Excuse me? Use that be damned teleport spell and take us to the dragon's lair. Torin added, Surely, your lordship, the Brotherhood is capable of tracking a massive creature that flies to the same location every year back to its lair. You wanted us to investigate, Danther said. This is where the investigation leads. The same place it always leads, to an interview with the primary suspect. Ithrin stared at them as if they were mad, for which Danthris couldn't entirely blame him. You wish to interview a creature that is thousands of years old, refuses to have any congress with any other races, and could kill you with a simple exhalation. Nodding, Torrin said, that sums it up, yes. I assume you can cast a transla translation spell that we may understand it course. <sighs> Ithrin sighed. You're both quite mad. Dethris found that being prepared for the teleport spell did nothing to hold down her nausea. Clutching her pained belly, Dethris glanced around at her new surroundings. Expecting a cave, she was surprised to find herself in a giant clearing in the midst of the forest of Nimvale. What fascinated her was that the clear what the clearing was made of. The ground on which she stood was like ash. Most of the clearing space was taken up by the dragon itself. Ithrin had brought them proximate to the dragon's head. The body was sprawled out on the ashen ground as far as even Danthris's sharp eyes could see. The dragon's eyes were shut, but then Ithrin sent something in what Danthris presumed to be the dragon's own tongue. A single eye, which by itself was about the size of Danthris's torso, opened at Ithrin's words. The dragon said something that was sufficiently loud that Danthris and Torin both had to cover their ears. Ithrin then made a quick gesture and muttered an incantation. A flash of light from something in his bag later, and the dragon's words became comprehensible. You be humans, are you not? I cannot recall the last time these eyes beheld a human. What brings you to my lair? Danthris stepped back to the edge of the clearing in the hope that it would help the assault on her ears. In addition, each time the dragon spoke, the temperature of the air around them rose, and there was only so much she could stand inside her leather armor. Not bothering to correct the dragon on her own heritage, about which he was only half right, she said, We wish to know why you killed two people in Cliff's End yesterday. What be Cliff's End? Torin said helpfully, The city-state over which you fly every midsummer. That be a city-state? I was not aware. Fascinating. Danthris couldn't believe this. You killed two people in that city-state. Did I? I do not recall. What brings you to my lair? We wish to know, Torrin said, why you burned down a building in Cliff's End yesterday. There be a city-state there? I'd just be looking for the marker. Ithrin quickly muttered an incantation, and then an image of the rock from the museum appeared before the dragon. Is this the marker you refer to? Will that be the marker near the sea? Well, every midsummer I check that marker, like Gamtar instructed. Midsummer be soon, be it not? Ithrin actually gaped an expression Danthris had never seen on a wizard before. Gamtar! You knew Gamtar! 
course I knew Gamtar. Twas my rider. Until he died. Then he stopped. So, Denver said slowly, you encircle Cliff's End every midsummer just for this marker. The marker? Well, that be what Gamtar charged me with checking until the end of my days. Each of the Sorfar be so charged. Torin asked, what happens now that the marker is gone? The marker be gone? Deathrest threw up her hands. You just told us, Ithran interrupted. What would you do if the marker was not present? Why would the marker not be present? Ithran held up a hand before Deathrest could explode in frustration. Enough, the mage said. We apologize for taking up so much of your time. Wait! Denthrist started before her stomach was again turned inside out, and she found herself back at the castle, standing next to her desk. While she was doubled over in agony, Torin whirled on, De on Ithrin. We were not finished with the interview. Yes, you were, De Ithrin said. Did you notice the color of the scales on the dragon's neck? In a weak voice, Denthrist replied, They were ochre. So what? What in the Norman lord and lady is going on? That was Osric, who had come from his office at the sudden noise of people arguing. Ithrin regarded the cap ignored the captain, and answered Danthrus's question. A golden dragon's neck scales turn that color after it's passed its 3,000th year. That particular type of dragon rarely lives past 2,000. Also, Gamtar was a dragon rider during the reign of Silene the Weary. It's likely that the marker was one of the cornerstones of the spell the dragon riders used to banish Helsec Gam a thousand years ago. Torrent frowned, but Helsec Gam returned from banishment and was killed. Denthrus raised a hand. I haven't the foggiest idea who any of those people are. Osric regarded Ithrin with something like amazement. You mean that rock that Fantar dug up was one of the rune stones that banished Helsic Gam? Quite likely, yes, Torrent said, which means that it is also quite likely that the dragon came out every midsummer to check on a marker that maintained a spell that is no longer running. Why would it do that, Ben Wivelt? asked Osric testily. Denthrus answered, because the dragon is 3,000 years old and hasn't got much of a brain left. The case is completed, Ithrin said dismissively. The Brotherhood will handle it from here. We will ensure that the museum returns the marker to its proper place for the time being. With that, he uttered the teleport spell and disappeared from the castle. Finally, I thought we'd never be rid of him. Torin asked Sergeant Jonas, who had just come dashing in for some tea for Danthrys, for which he was grateful. Sitting at her desk, she said, So that's that, then. The entire ridiculous midsummer ritual, the parades, the bets, the celebrations, the rioting, the drunken idiocy, all of it was because a dragon was too dim to realize he shouldn't keep doing what he'd been told to do by a writer who's a thousand years dead. Osric scowled. Midsummer isn't ridiculous, Tresillian. It's the most popular festival of the year. Do you know how much coin is made during midsummer? Including by us, thanks to all the overtime, Torin added with a smile. Perhaps... I'll still take sleep over this nonsense again. Well, it may not matter. Torin was now scratching his thick beard. The dragon will die soon. So? Osric said. People will still expect it. and It'll give them something new to bet on. Besides, who cares why it started? It's tradition, so it'll continue. Joy, Danthrus muttered. I hate Midsummer. That story appeared in Dragon's Lure, which was published in 2010 from Dark Quest Books. Good luck finding it, but you can find it in Tales from Dragon Precinct, which was reissued by Eastbeck Books in 2018 uh, with a spiffy cover, uh, so you can get it there. Um, please do check it out. Um, check me out online at dekendido.net. Uh, there's links there to support the latest Dragon Precinct story, the Gorvangan Rampages. Um, you can uh, read my blog at dekendido.wordpress.com. Uh, you can support me on Patreon at patreon.com slash crad. Uh, and you can subscribe to this particular YouTube channel. Uh, if you click on the Crad COVID readings thing under this video, you can uh, subscribe to it and be alerted when there's a new video. Uh, I try to do one every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at this point. So uh, keep an eye out. I've got lots, of, lots more stories to read and lots of cool stuff planned. So thank you very much, and please stay safe.